So this is a very important article here in Australia. So Greg Barnes, who is Julian's legal representative, um, one of them in Australia, Australian diplomats have reportedly uh, visited Julian Assange in Ecuador's embassy in London to hear firsthand about what his lawyer says is his deteriorating health. He said he and his colleagues will now directly appeal to Foreign Minister Maurice Payne to petition the U UK government to let Assange leave the embassy for urgent medical care without being arrested. The Australian High Commission in London refused to comment on the visit, even to confirm it, referring all questions to the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra, a clear sign the situation is still a diplomatic quagmire. But Barnes said it was the second such visit. So the visit came a day before Assange received the bad news from the US, where a federal judge refused to force the Justice Department to admit the existence of what are believed to be criminal charges laid against him in secret. However, Britain won't drop the arrest warrant uh, for his uh, failure to show for extradition to Sweden. He cannot leave the embassy due to the likelihood of being extradited to the US where they say he would not receive a fair trial. Um, they have been, uh, they have seen firsthand the untenable situation Julian is in. We're going into the seventh year. This man is locked in a room virtually now because his, his access to various parts of the embassy um, has been restricted. I think a firm and assertive defence of Australia's citizens' consular rights, as in the case of other countries, Cambodia and Egypt, would actually work if the Australian government had the gumption to push this uh, to the point where it needs to be pushed. There's no reason why the Australian government shouldn't be fighting for Assange's return from his eight years of temporary and increasingly dangerous asylum in the Ecuador embassy in London. We should be standing up for ourselves and making our own foreign policy choices. Yes, well, that? I'm just on my screen share um, at the moment, uh, looking at uh, Brinkmer's own words, the settled rule that the court will not anticipate a question of constitutional law in advance of the necessity of deciding it. Petit uh, versus United States. It, it requires that the committee's application be dismissed um, until there is sufficiently certain disclosure that charges have in, in fact been filed. The committee's common law and First Amendment claims are premature. To hold otherwise would mean that any member of the public or press, by demanding access to judicial records based on little more than speculation, could effectively force the government to admit or deny that charges had been filed, permitting such fishing expeditions would require courts to sort through endless factual permutations, giving rise to varying degrees of uncertainty. Courts cannot perform the delicate balancing required by the First Amendment and common law do doctrines under such uh, uncertain circumstances. So what does that say, Kathy? Uh, She's covering <laughs> for the government. She's covering for the government that inadvertently told the world that he's been charged. And this well, supposed I to be thought to have an independent judiciary in the United States. And, and, and the word leaks out that a grand jury exists. And then the uh, Julian Assange and his legal team come in to ask the court to unseal the indictment so that Julian Assange in particular and his legal team can understand the indictment. And the judge says, well, the public's desire to to understand what ha what's happening is quote premature, like what does that mean? Th those that's her words. It's a premature desire to learn the truth about a, 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 a secret grand jury. So it's, a secret grand jury is in existence apparently. It inadvertently through a court filing is acknowledged to to in fact exist. Julian Assange goes into court. And the judge rules, quote, courts cannot perform 
the delicate balancing required by the First Amendment and common law doctrines under such circumstances. And then by, by acknowledging uh, if she were to unseal the indictment, she would be revealing that a grand jury in fact does exist and the government has kept the grand jury secret. So then you must ask yourself, what's the point of having a court? What's the point of having a court if the judges feel so duty bound to defend the national surveillance state, even as it commits and conducts itself in illegal ways? Uh, what's the point of having a court? I mean, it truly is a Kafkaesque nightmare uh, whereby no one can actually, no one is entitled to learn the truth. And if you learn the truth and want it confirmed, your desire to learn the truth is, quote, premature. Because, of course, the secret keepers haven't made it publicly available information. But nor will they. That's the point of a secret grand jury proceeding. I mean, it's really, uh, it makes one's head spin. I'd like to talk for a second, though, Joe, about um, about charges that Julian may be facing. I think the conventional wisdom is probably right that that the Justice Department is charging him with espionage or espionage-related um, crimes. In, a, in any other district in America, this would be ludicrous. It would be outrageous. And, and I'll tell you why. I, um, I was desperate to not go to prison uh, after my arrest. And so I hired O.J. Simpson's jury consultant. He happened to be my best friend's wife's uncle. So he did it for nothing. He came up to DC. We went to the trouble of getting him a security clearance so that he could review my case. And um, he got it very quickly and uh, went through 15,000 pages of discovery and then said to me, if we were in any other district in America, I'd say, we win this thing. It's easy. Hands down, we win it. But the Eastern District of Virginia, you don't have a prayer. Your jury is going to be made up of people from the CIA, the FBI, the Defense Department, Homeland Security, and intelligence community contractors. He said, you just don't have a prayer. Take a plea. That's why they charged Julian in the Eastern District of Virginia. No crime was committed in the Eastern District of Virginia or anywhere else for that matter. But they charged him there because they knew that the deck was stacked. And in any other district in America, people would see the truth, that the man's a journalist. He was simply disseminating information, information in the public good, and should not be prosecuted for that. That's the exercise of, of freedom of speech. But that's not how it's going to play out. Now, there are certainly... There are certainly more minor charges that could have been levied against him that he may have been able to, or may be, still be able to um, negotiate, where you could maybe negotiate it down to a misdemeanor count of, let's say, failure to secure classified information, which is what uh, uh, General Petraeus got. But um, my real fear is they're not interested in a deal. They're interested only in coming down on him like a ton of bricks, and that's why it's in EDVA. Well, that's uh, very troubling. Uh, in your case, did they invoke state secret privilege? I'm asking because this could also happen with uh, Stone, maybe, if they try to challenge. Absolutely, they did. Um, in the very first uh, hearing, they did. It's called um, an invocation of the SIPA Act, the Classified Information Protection Act. And so that meant several different things. It meant that, um, that no one was allowed inside the courtroom unless they were cleared. So it was my attorneys and me, the prosecutors, the judge, the bailiff, and one clerk who took the classified um, uh, transcript. And that was it. The door was physically locked so nobody could come in. And then when they would declare it a SIPA hearing and throw everybody out and lock the door, they would then sweep the whole courtroom for bugs. And it was only then that we could begin uh, talking. 
Now they overdid that because there really was no relevant classified information in my case. And that, that was my argument from the beginning was that it was all unclassified or if it was classified, it was improperly classified. Uh, and again, I fear they're gonna do the same thing with Julian. Just say everything is classified, everything is a secret, it's all national security, when in fact it's not, not at all. You, you, you and your defense were allowed to re remain present for that hearing. I thought that they kicked everybody out. Like in no, the Sabelle Edmonds case, I think in Sabelle Edmonds case, she and her lawyers weren't even allowed to be there. Is that right? That happened to me once um, where we had asked for, we had asked for 70 documents to be declassified. So we, we had filed um, 70 separate motions and I, I needed these 70 documents to defend myself. And so as soon as we went in, the prosecutors, invoked SIPA, and then they asked for, um, it was called a Part C hearing or Part D hearing, something like that. I had never heard of it. And as soon as they said, request a Part D hearing, my lawyers jumped up simultaneously and said, objection. And I said, what's going on? And they told me, hold on a second, this is important. And so, um, so, the judge said that she'll she'll hear the prosecution in camera and my lawyers objected again and then said at least let us come in without our client and she said no that it was in camera so she goes into her chambers with only the prosecutors and then she comes back out and she says i'm going to save everybody a lot of time and i'm going to reject all 70 of these motions so I never had any idea why I was being denied the ability to defend myself. Whatever the decision was, it was classified, and neither my attorneys nor I had um, the right to know. And so here we are, uh, that was uh, seven years ago, and I still don't know why my motions were denied. Julian's going to go through the same thing. I believe that there still is a second chance and Joe, you can come in and verify this for me. There is a second chance to have um, the charges unsealed uh, from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, because that is one of the requests. And as far as I know, that is, um, that is another attempt, isn't it? Or is it the same one to get the charges unsealed? It's part of the uh, petition that was filed by WikiLeaks to that Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, part of the American Organization of American States, to end uh, Julian's isolation and to unseal that criminal complaint. But I have to tell so, you, being a student of American history and politics, of the, <laughs> they look upon international organizations uh, as with disdain. The moment they do something that Washington doesn't like. We've seen that with the International Court of Justice, which ordered the U.S. to stop mining the harbors of Managua during the Civil War in Nicaragua in the 1980s. Uh, we see it all the time at the U.N., where they don't get the resolution to invade Iraq. They invade Iraq anyway. So they use it as a way to sanction what they're going to do anyway. Uh, the, in fact, inside the Bush administration, just an aside, there were many who didn't even want to go to the U.N. I think it was... Uh, particularly Cheney, but it was Powell who forced them. And uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't get the resolution, but it, it was totally immaterial to their aims. So even if this court uh, uh, tells Ecuador that, um, well, they would have to tell the US to unseal this US being a member of the OAS. They, so the court has some jurisdiction over the US. They could tell them you must unseal this and they will be laughed at. I, I guarantee that. They do not have legally binding or uh, judgments. They could tell them uh, the only thing that the members of the OAS are obliged to do is cooperate. So the U.S. would have to respond to a request, and that response would be no. And um, they have no enforcement mechanism. Nobody and in, in no international organization has an enforcement mechanism except the Security Council. Uh, even the International Criminal Court cannot doesn't have a police force to arrest. They have to rely on governments to arrest someone who's been indicted as a war criminal at the ICC. So only the UN Security Council could impose sanctions and authorize war, um, which is what the US wanted in Iraq and didn't get, but didn't stop them. So I, uh, I don't want to make light too much of what that uh, 
uh, international, I think it has a political significance like a general assembly resolution, which can embarrass governments, can show the will. So if, a, if the court decides to tell the U.S. unseal this, that should be news. It won't be reported. We'll certainly report a consortium news. We'll discuss it on this vigil. Uh, and it shows that uh, an international organization ruled in favor of WikiLeaks. That's significant. But they cannot get it enforced or, or binding on the U.S. So uh, that, this is a final decision by Brinkema. There is a way out that I can see which requires a certain exercise of courage and decency on the part of an Australian government, whether this one or the next one, which is, I hope, coming very soon. And that is for the Australian government to, first of all, make aggressive representations in London to have Assange's jumping bail charge set aside because the Swedish government has withdrawn all prosecution. So it wouldn't be beyond the capacity of the Australian High Commission in London, our embassy there, to prevail upon the British government to waive that or set it aside. The next step would be, and I, I, I don't want to sound like a John le Carré novel, but things happen, would be for the Australian High Commissioner to drive in his car to the Ecuador Embassy to pick up Assange, to drive him under the High Commissioner's protection, possibly with a British police escort, straight to Heathrow Airport onto the tarmac, onto a waiting Australian Qantas plane, because we actually have a direct Qantas flight, the Australian National Airline, from London to Perth without stops. And once Assange is on that plane, there is no way he could be touched by the Americans until he gets to Perth. It would then become an issue for the Australian government and the American government what to do with Assange. But I believe that no Australian government would dare to extradite Assange to the United States without a proper legal process, without a proper charge tested in an Australian court. If the Australian ambassador, High Commissioner, walked into the Ecuador embassy and walked out hand in hand with Assange and put him straight into an embassy car, I cannot see Assange being arrested. If, if the Australian government had taken the legal steps beforehand of clearing it with the British government to say, look, this is ridiculous, we're going to take him home. Can you give us some insight from your own experience about how prosecutors can be extremely dishonest and deceptive uh, to mislead the public? Oh boy, there are literally no rules for, uh, for prosecutors or for federal investigators. They can lie, they can deceive, they can cheat, they can do anything they want. And one thing that I, I kick myself for not reminding myself when, when it was happening to me, is they always know the answer to the question before they ask it. And so where many of us get wrapped up uh, is by trying to please them, trying to rack your brain to give them a, an honest answer. And then you end up misspeaking. That, that misspeaking can be used against you, of course, as a felony uh, making a false statement charge or in some cases, an obstruction of justice charge, just say, I don't recall. That's it, that's a legitimate response. I do not recall. Um, when, when I had been arrested, I was charged in addition to other things with one count of um, uh, making a false statement. I hadn't made any false statement. And of course that, that charge was dropped, but the prosecutors threatened me with another false statements charge and an obstruction of justice charge because I kept saying I don't recall. The honest to God's truth was that I didn't recall. And they were furious that I didn't give them an answer that they could then use against me. Well, that's one of the tricks that they have. That's the leverage that they have over you because once you make that mistake, they immediately file a felony charge and then they offer later on to trade it. Well, we'll drop these charges if you talk about so-and-so, or we'll drop all these other charges if you take a plea to a reduced charge. And that way they get a conviction, and that way they get a promotion, and they get a $400 performance award, and then they get to put your name on the ticker at the bottom of their website, and, uh, and they all uh, congratulate themselves. That's the system, the corrupt system that we have. We hear about so many things. There's been so many violations right from day one with Julian in, in, in Sweden. The police went to the press. 
William Binney talked about Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7. So I went and dug that up. So Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, that is illegal to classify information that would conceal a crime. Let's read the actual mm. thing. Uh, in no case shall information be classified, continue to be maintained as classified, or fail to be declassified in order to conceal violations of law, inefficiency, or administrative error, or two, to prevent embarrassment to a person, organization, or agency. This law, this is President Obama's 2009 executive order, and it is not being observed. That is the problem. And you make a good point uh, that in a trial, if there were one, uh, in a national security trial like uh, Julian Assange would face in terms of classified information, he could not use this as a defense, I don't think. Uh, well, you could not use a defense or a political what, what his motives were. You cannot, as, as Dan Ellsberg said on one of these vigils when he got on the stand, he wanted to explain why he leaked pending on papers, and he could say that. But perhaps they could bring this forward that the classified documents that WikiLeaks has published all should not have been classified to begin with, or at least many of them, based on this executive order you just said. They should not have been classified because they were about crimes or embarrassment. Absolutely. Gareth, you want to add anything? Well, um, what, I, what I was just thinking was that um, if that principle uh, that, that has just been enunciated in, in the law that was passed or that was promulgated by President Obama that was just shown on the screen had been applied in the case of John Kiriakou, surely he would have been declared innocent or would, there would be no case because if there ever was a, a case that involved clear-cut crime, it would have been John Kiriakou's case uh -huh. where he was being Absolutely. and which president and which president uh, prosecuted John Kiriakou? Oh, Obama, the same one who issued that order. Exactly, exactly. So there you are. I guess we are in a we're in a maze here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, did he really mean it? <laughs> There's a question that we should ask. Um, you know, he. He made a lot of promises, Obama, and he <laughs> went ahead and did quite the opposite. He prosecuted more whistleblowers, um, charged them with espionage than in all of recorded history. Yeah, um, I've got one more screenshot that just came through from our, our elves, our fact-checking elves in, in the background. I'd just love to show you. This is a joke. This is a joke. You're going to laugh. Okay, uh, here we go. Where's my Chrome? Here we go. Share. Okay, so uh, apparently it is legal to lie to Congress. False Accountability Act, FSAA, was sponsored by one term freshman Senator William Martini, who later became a federal judge. It, it included a bizarre subsection that permits judges, attorneys, and parties to lie to Congress, to courts, and agencies without liability. There you go. <laughs> the Ninth Circuit Judge uh, Susan P. Graber is, is a congressional, uh, le uh, you know, legislative uh, designation rather than a than a law. Yeah. A law Right. I mean, that's that doesn't suggest that it was already passed. I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it does say here, learn about the 1996 law they passed while you were asleep to make sure that no one goes to jail. Hmm. So, um, while, but that 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 should that requires further looking into, um, yeah. which I would well, do. well, if this ever became law, then you could lie and not go to jail, and in Julian Assange's cases, you could tell the truth and go to jail. <laughs> Well, that's the same for everybody, isn't it? This is the this is the great problem. How do we, the public, ever get the truth? I was saying uh, in one of my memes, if it is illegal to classify information that reveals that conceals crimes, but it is also illegal to publish information that reveals them. 
crime wins in the end, doesn't it? I mean, that's that's why we're in such a terrible state of not knowing what the hell's going on and things just being done by people who who benefit from secrecy and impunity. And, uh, you know, it's happening here in Australia uh, as well, in particular with respect to refugees. And Julian is a refugee. It's appalling. I think Joe was just going to say something. Go ahead. No, I was going to say they have their bases, all their bases covered there. So uh, when, when, when they want you to lie and get away with it, you can. And when you tell the truth, you can't. So Australia needs to reassert its belief, which we had in 1949 when we helped negotiate the UN Charter and the UN Security Council rules. We need to reaffirm our belief in multipolarity in a concert of independent and sovereign nations who come together in the cause of international security. We have to get away from this idea of us and them, that we are the good guys and Russia and China are the bad guys. There are no good guys, there are no bad guys. There's simply a a multipolar world in which Australia as a middle power has to navigate its way. I'm not saying we should be anti-American, of course not, or anti-British, but we need to rediscover our independence of outlook.